Hi everyone, this is Jay Chen. Welcome to the Real Estate Tax Tips channel. Um, my goal is to become the Google map for hardworking Canadians seeking financial freedom. Today I have Seth Ferguson here. I'm so lucky. We're so all very lucky to have him here. I think he's way better at doing this interview job than I do, but I'll try my best to keep the uh, question going. Um, so we have Seth here. Um, he's the multifamily investment guy, mostly about Canadian investing in US. And so we're very lucky to have you here asking about the process and everything about that. But before we go into the um, nuts and bolts, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button below. If you like this um, uh, video, make sure that you give us a like and thumbs up and YouTube will promote it to the people that will find this uh, video informative as well. And make sure you leave a comment too for Cherry. Oh. <laughs> Tell her she's doing a good job. <laughs> Thank you. See, he's already better. Okay. So tell us a little bit about your investment journey. Just for the record, he's Canadian. <laughs> yeah, so I started off my investing journey like many other people. Mm -hmm. um, I started uh, acquiring single family homes yep. because that's all I knew. Yep. Um, I had my real estate license. Yep. I was selling the product day to day. That's the product I knew. Yeah. So I just started acquiring residential properties. You know, did a duplex conversion. You know, was able to leverage one property into the next one and, and grow things from there. Um, and everything was going pretty good. It was my partner and I at the time who were mm -hmm. building the portfolio. Um, one of the challenges though that a lot of people have is uh, cash flow. You yeah. know, I was equity rich, cash flow poor, yeah. um, just like investing anywhere in the GTA right now. Um, and uh, it was a challenge to scale. Um, you know, at some point you hit a wall yeah. and, and financing the next property is a challenge. Uh, cash flow, even though you have so much equity, accessing the ex equity uh, can be you know, a, a battle sometimes with the lenders. Um, and, but everything was going okay. Um, and then uh, that portfolio ceased to exist. Uh, what happened? Well, uh, some uh, craziness happened. Um, my, my partner at the time um, did some things to the portfolio, uh, like wiping out the bank accounts and uh -oh. refusing to lease the properties, et cetera. Um, and, uh, that sounded horrible. What kind of partner is that? Uh, Who doesn't want to make money? Yeah, exactly. And actually, fast forward today with the increase in values that we've had, we're talking like millions of dollars of difference um, if uh, that was still intact uh, today. But uh, yeah, so, so what happened was that portfolio ceased to exist. It was um, everything was sold off and uh, yeah, it, 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 it sucked. Um, but uh, that, that kind of opened up the door for me to pursue a different type of real estate, which was multifamily. Um, and that's what we'll talk a lot about today, and I'm sure we'll get into it uh, quite a bit. But uh, it, it really opened up my eyes to what's out there uh, because I was pretty ignorant mm. about what multifamily and apartments was all about. And I know a lot of people, they drive by apartment buildings and they think, oh, well, that's just some rich guy or that's Absolutely. a rich company that yeah. owns it. No, that's not the case. You know, normal people can actually invest in own apartment buildings. Um, it's just introducing yourself into this hidden world um, that, uh, you know, a lot of people just don't know about. So hopefully today after our conversation, everybody can feel a whole I lot I don't know better. about that. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm pretty sure you will explain, but I, I just feel the same way. I could totally relate looking at the building. I'm just like, I don't have the capital. I don't want to learn another method of investing. Mm -hmm. Going back to your story, you said your partner went a little bit crazy yeah. and then you have to get rid of the entire portfolio. So that means you must have like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to invest in multifamily. Uh, no, <laughs> no. Well, uh, like I alluded to, uh, uh, we had some money that uh, disappeared from the joint bank accounts and uh, she took that. Oh no. Um, and uh, yeah, it was basically the worst case scenario. Actually, we should plug uh, Irwin's uh, podcast and hear the <laughs> full story there. Uh, get some cross uh, collaboration going there. Uh, but yeah, like, like basically it was run into the ground. Um, there was a separation that was uh, happening at the same time. Mm. Surprise, surprise. Uh, so but basically, you know, from one day I had the nice house, I had all this stuff, um, and then the locks got changed on the house, the money disappeared. And the locks got changed too? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh the, uh, yeah, some, the car disappeared <laughs> from the what? gym parking lot. Lots of crazy stuff. My um, God. Oh yeah, you haven't heard all this stuff. No, I no, haven't. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, so, so it basically like I went from doing really well mm. to not having very much um, and my life basically changed uh, overnight, you could say. Uh, so um, oh, yeah, I'm it, so sorry. Yeah, it, it, it was really rough. Um, but I am I'm happy it happened uh, because it forced me to change and it forced me to look at other options. And uh, like I said, like many people, scaling was big and I had big goals. Like when my son came along, mm. I wanted to really uh, expand my real estate investment portfolio for him, not for myself anymore. And single family just wasn't the right fit for me because I couldn't scale to the level I needed to scale to. Yep. Um, and if, if that wouldn't have happened, I'd probably still be fighting in single family rather than thinking bigger on the multifamily side. So, you know, pros and cons, like I, I'm, I, I'm glad it happened. It was the best thing that really happened to me, even though it was the worst thing. You know what, like I'm currently reading a book called uh, The Gap and the Gain. It's a new book. <clears throat> kind of co-author by Dan Sullivan. I don't know if you know Dan Sullivan. Oh, Dan, yeah. Yes, yeah. Dan Sullivan from Strategic, the founder of uh, Strategic Coach. Um, and with also um, uh, this guy called Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Okay. And uh, basically they talk about high achiever who typically focus on the gap. So the gap is they have this ideal and uh, they are living, like they're, they have done a lot already. But then if they every, t every time they look at their progress, they're not happy because they always look at the ideal. So they only see the gap of the between yeah. that and uh, never look back to see how far they've come. And yeah. um, I especially appreciate what you just said because you learned you said that you learned so much from that bad experience mm -hmm. as bad as it is. You've they said that in the book, if you could look at a bad experience and learn from it and truly appreciate it, that means you are fully recovered from it. Oh, that's interesting. That's what oh, it says. Okay. Yeah, oh. they, they're not psychologists. They're really practical people. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's just from years of working with entrepreneurs like you and I, and they've discovered that, hey, for people who are truly happy, they have to appreciate how far they have come. Yeah, well, I'm sure, like, you and Erwin find this, too. Like, it's very, like, it's hard to look back yes. like, because you're always looking to do better and, yep. and do more. But, yeah, like, going back to when everything crashed, I wouldn't be, you know, the first thing I did was start a podcast. Then yep. I started the YouTube channel and, and everything grew from there. And yep. I wouldn't have had the podcast if that didn't happen. Mm. And now, you know, I have this big like multifamily conference coming up. That wouldn't have happened without the podcast. Yeah. And, and so it all kind of snowballs from there. And then even it's funny, too, because like one thing I noticed with the podcast, um, like I got to interview some really cool people. And, uh, you know, lots of them, like a guy like Rod Cleef, yeah. um, you know, he lost like 50 million bucks in 2008 and he lost his mansion and everything. But like, so he lost, he got destroyed and lots of guys uh, ended up like this too. But then now they've rebuilt even better um, than, you know, where they were at before. So it's almost like they, they hit rock bottom and they use that to bounce up mm. and, and, and their bounce is even higher. So yeah, it's... Uh, it's, it's really cool. I mean, your story is inspiring. It got me into thinking about the book and got me apply. Like, it's really true that you always should focus on the gain, how far you've come, and turn a negative experience into a learning experience, and learning experience is always a gain. Yeah. I should yeah. come in here once a week to have a chat with you. <laughs> I feel I'm a whole not, lot better about I'm myself. not a therapist. I'm just saying that, like, that's what I'm listening to these days. Yeah. Like, not reading, because I love li listening to books. Yeah. Um, Probably also the reason why I haven't listened to Erwin's podcast because I'm busy listening to the books. <laughs> um, so you talk about having essentially nothing mm -hmm. to start thinking about investing in multifamily. But how do you like? How do you structure? How do you find money? Because everyone knows that we need money to make money. You know, like that's the general consensus. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's so. When we look at real estate investing, I'll use like a single family investing. Mm -hmm. uh, scenario and and, and uh, compare that to a multifamily scenario. So with single family homes, everybody knows about joint ventures, right? Yep. So, you know, somebody's gonna find the property, run it, somebody's probably going to sign for financing, yep. uh, front the equity needed, and that's a 50-50 joint partnership. Um, that's very common. 
Uh, so if somebody is really good at finding deals and really good at managing them, but they don't have the financing, they can joint, uh, you know, create a joint venture with somebody and grow their portfolio mm -hmm. that way. That's very common. And you know, when somebody taps out for financing and growing their portfolio, that's obviously the, the yeah. next step that lots of people use. Um, with multifamily, it's similar, but very different. So, um, and we can go into this uh, later on too with structuring, but um, with the joint partnership, like both people are active in the investment, even though somebody's like, they, people like to call it passive investing because, oh, I just signed on the financing mm -hmm. or I'm, I'm just providing the capital. If something goes belly up with the deal, um, your risk is unlimited, yeah. right? Because you're, you're an active party. Um, with multifamily, uh, depending on the structuring you use, if you use, uh, for instance, a syndication structure, uh, if you're raising capital from passive investors, so there's always people looking to put their money to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can raise that capital from passive investors, syndicate the deal, so the investors are, are offered many protections, uh, the risk is limited, and then you can run and manage the deal mm -hmm. and, and uh, you need money, you need skin in the game. Like nobody's going to invest money with you without skin in the mm -hmm. game, but it doesn't, you don't need $10 million to take down an apartment building. Um, you know, this is why you raise equity from other investors who partner with you um, in the deal. And, and then uh, the syndication, the entity runs the deal. Ah, oh, okay, okay, okay. So you partner up with people who want a somewhat passive investment and then they get a return uh, in exchange and then um, and then they also get liability protection. Co correct, yeah. So uh, structuring is really important. Um, mm. You know, it's, there's people, I have fr friends of mine who uh, purchase and acquire apartment buildings using a partnership. So mm. it'll be four partners and they acquire the property. Maybe two will uh, bring in the capital, one will have the deal and the, yeah, yeah. the fourth one will manage it. Uh, for instance. Um, but with a syndication structure or a real estate fund structure, we have um, you know, a general partnership and a limited partnership. Mm. And uh, what, what that allows the limited partners to do is invest without that risk exposure. Um, so with that, joint, uh, with that active joint venture example, mm. um, even though you're just bringing the capital, your risk is unlimited. You could, like a lender or a creditor could, not come, yeah. could come after you and just take everything. Um, with a limited partnership, um, you are very protected. So you're risking your, your capital, um, your investment, but mm. your risk stops there. Mm. The, the general partnership takes the uh, shoulders, the brunt of the liability in that case. Yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah. That so provides protection. And I guess my next question is because you're kind of being known to be the Canadian investing in US multifamily. Um, why are you not investing in Canada? What's yeah. wrong with Canada? What's wrong with Canada? <laughs> Nothing's wrong with Canada. Um, if uh, you are a tenant in uh, Ontario mm -hmm. and uh, BC. Um, so th that's a really good question. And you know, when, when I was trying to figure out what am I gonna do, mm -hmm. um, I, I looked at uh, Canada, uh, I looked at the US, and th there's a number of reasons why somebody would be drawn to the US. Um, mm -hmm. When you look at the, the size of uh, you know the the economic juggernaut that is the United States, mm. we are like the planet Earth compared to the Sun. Yeah, um, there is no comparison whatsoever. Um, and when we're looking at the size of markets, um, when you look at Canada, we have a handful of key markets in the country. The U.S. totally different story. Um, also, you have uh, different uh, climates as well. Here in Canada, you're not going to find a garden style apartment mm -hmm. uh, because we're not going to have pools outside uh, because you can only use them for a portion of the year. Yep. Uh, we go down to the Sun Belt, garden style is very popular. Uh, you have pools, other outdoor amenities that just don't really exist here because of uh, you know our climate differences. Now, of course, we've you've got hurricanes down there, yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's it's a bit of a toss up. But for me, I wanted I wanted to focus on uh, you know an economic powerhouse that is the U.S. Um, the landlord tenant laws, depending on the state, um, will vary. So, for instance, California, mm. um, that's a rent control uh, state, not as bad as here here in Ontario, but it's still up there. Um, but you know, you look at Texas. Uh, you look at Florida, um, other states, it's very uh, pro-landlord. You mm. can do a lot more. Um, you can uh, bring your rents up to market value and actually get a return that you should be getting uh, when you're doing renovations. That's awesome. Uh, so it just makes it a whole lot easier. 
So tell me like a typical investment, how it works, like how many units are in a particular, uh, I guess, apartment that you are investing? Yeah, so right now we're hunting for uh, apartments, 100 units uh, to about 250 units. Mm. That's our criteria. Uh, the reason is uh, once you get about over 90 units, the economies of scale work in your favor. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if somebody owns like a 10 unit apartment, they'll know like it's a lot of uh, grunt work that you're doing your own because the, the building, the cash flow doesn't support mm. full time management. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you get into these larger buildings, uh, let's say it's a 150 unit property, you have full time staff, you have full time uh, caretakers. Rather than a property manager showing up once a week or once a month, uh, so you have staff there every single day because you're looking after 150 units. Uh, the the impact or, or the level of care that's taken on the property because if you have somebody there every day you know problems are going to be taken care of sooner yep. uh, you're going to have a better relationship uh, from your management uh, with the tenants um, it's just it's just more of a you're running more of a business and what i say is you're actually buying a business that just happens to be attached to real estate at that uh, point yeah it's yeah. true that's right yeah. so how like i know you also do target um or I should say you also use this Burr strategy with your investment. Even yeah. though it's 150 unit, you can still use this Burr strategy. So let's start with what's Burr. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so Burr, uh, I'm going to miss an R here, but it's yeah, like buy, uh, renovate, uh, refinance, rent, repeat. Yeah. Um, so that, that's for a single family type of property. Uh, with multifamily, it's very similar, mm. um, but there are some key differences. So with single family, and one of the, struggles I had was uh, no matter how much rent your property is producing with single family, um, those properties are valued using the comparable approach. Yes. So if there's three houses on the street that are selling for 500, well, okay, let's use a million bucks in the mm. GTA. Yeah. Um, and, and your house is similar. Well, guess what? Your house is worth a million bucks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with commercial property, we use the income approach. So it's all based on uh, the net operating income, the NOI produced by the property, mm -hmm. uh, which gives you as an investor a lot more control over the value of your property. So when we're looking at forcing appreciation um, in a multifamily property, where it's all, it all centers around um, boosting up that NOI. So mm -hmm. pushing those gross rents, optimizing expenses. And if we can... Uh, you know, move the property up to uh, a higher class. So let's say it's a B plus property and we, or let's say a C plus property and we can move it to a B. Um, you know, we're going to be valued at a lower cap rate, which is going to give us more uh, value per every dollar uh, produced by the property. So very similar to flipping a house. It's just over a longer time period. So let's say 18 to 24 months versus three months with a single family home. Um, and the idea is still the same. Like we're looking at an underperforming asset, uh, renovating, uh, you know, uh, optimizing that property, and then either uh, refinancing, holding it for a couple extra years, selling it depending on uh, what's going on. So what's the investment horizon in terms of like when you, from the time that you purchase to renovate to sometimes eventually sell? Of course, I know, even though I am not a tax expert in the U.S. tax um, <laughs> arena, but I, I know that U.S., if you hold a property for a certain time, you have a long-term capital gain tax rate compared to if you sell it within a certain time, you're kind of screwed. Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, investment horizon, generally speaking, a rule of thumb is you're looking at five to seven years. Yeah. Now, I, I should say, you know, there are some uh, syndicators who, uh, if you're going after like a double A class property, mm -hmm. so prime locations, prime properties, uh, you know, you may be looking at a 10 year hold. It all depends on the business plan for that specific property. Um, and, you know, um, you could be looking at a five year hold, but mm -hmm. you can meet. 80% of your targets in year three, you'll probably end up selling in year three if you can do that. So it all depends on the specific property. Um, but yeah, the, you brought up a good point with, you know, holding indefinitely or holding for a long period of time. Um, you have to really look at uh, your return on equity, not just return on investment. Mm. Um, and this is where I think uh, a lot of new investors getting into the space get kind of caught up. Um, they're looking at, okay, well, yeah, so I invested X amount. I'm getting this amount of return on my investment. This is a good deal. Well, look at the equity that, that's now tied up. Doesn't make more sense to actually sell the property, 
um, and then move your money into a new property and repeat the process all over again and take advantage of the U.S. tax code. Oh. Uh, that gives us depreciation, <laughs> bonus depreciation. Yep. Um, that's, that is a totally different system to what we have here in Canada. Yeah. So um, it, we always want to be making sure our money's working as hard as possible and, the, and, and holding real estate indefinitely isn't going to make sure that dollar is working as hard as it can be. So that's why it makes more sense. Acquire an underperforming asset, improve that asset, sell the asset, rinse and repeat, and take advantage of those uh, tax credits. Okay, I have three questions. Okay, I have like <laughs> I could come up with a lot of questions as I talk to you. I, I but hope I, I have four, answers. I promise it's just going to be three questions. So, okay. like these sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. Tell us about um, like because you're looking at 150 unit, and in my mind, 150 units seems like it's an astronomical number in terms of investment. Like what's the amount that they could invest or Canadians can invest with you mm -hmm. or being your partner? Well, I, I think first we have to back up a little bit yep. and talk about who can really invest in these opportunities mm, depending yep. on the structure. Yep. Uh, so when, uh, when we have Canadians investing in the U.S., we have to be very careful because we have two different sets of uh, tax securities tax, laws yep, yep. Um, plus tax codes oh, that we're yeah, dealing with. Oh, yeah, security law too. Yeah, you don't want to uh, go yep. on the wrong side of the SEC. Um, and when we're looking at investing in the U.S., yep. in the U.S. it's federal, mm -hmm. uh, but in Canada it's provincial, mm -hmm. uh, which complicates things as well, even though things are getting a whole lot better with that. <laughs> um, so when we're looking at syndications and real estate funds, um, it's most of the opportunities available to Canadians, you have to be an accredited investor. Mm. And what that means is you have to have an income uh, on your own of $200,000 or more. Mm. As a couple, $300,000 or more, or a hundred, or sorry, a million dollars of net assets, not including your principal residence. Mm. Um, once you meet that, that criteria, or those criteria, I, I should say, um, you are able to then uh, participate in these opportunities that aren't really available to the general public. Mm. And I think uh, the securities laws are one of the reasons why there's so much mystery around multifamily. Because for the longest time, um, you know, you couldn't advertise these opportunities. Like the general public had no idea that these deals were happening. Uh, but with changes uh, with, you know, U.S. securities legislation and everything, um, it's opening up to more people. Uh, but we still have we have, still have to uh, take into account the Canadian securities laws <laughs> as well. So in the U.S., it's a little bit different. Uh, you know, you can be a non-accredited investor as long as you're sophisticated. Uh, depending on the offering, that's a totally different rabbit hole. 506B versus 506C. Yeah. Um, that doesn't apply to Canadians. But with Canadians, as long as you're an accredited investor, either through income or net assets, mm. net assets, um, these opportunities are available to you. Oh, cool. Like, so then my original question was, what's the minimum oh, yeah, amount? Yeah. Like, I, I, I understand why it is it, it's important because a lot of people may not meet that criteria. Yeah. Um, I didn't even recognize that too. Uh, I guess I should clarify by, follow, like by following up with a different question is yeah. that it's only when they invest in these syndication, Correct. if they were to go to the U.S. to buy um, uh, a house or a duplex, that would not have been the case. Correct. Or if you are uh, enter into a partnership with somebody or you're joint venturing on an apartment deal, mm -hmm. that doesn't apply. The, the only reason why the accredited investor criteria uh, comes into play is because you're now into securities territory uh, when you're syndicating a deal. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's nothing... Uh, stopping you, let's say you don't meet the accredited investor criteria, mm -hmm. but you're bringing something to the mix. Yep. Um, you can uh, partner with somebody. You know, the thing I, the thing I talk about all the time is I call it the real estate matrix. You need four things for every deal. Mm. You need the deal. You need uh, the capital. You need financing and you need management. So if you can bring one of those things to the mix, uh, you can form a partnership and run the deal. But when we're talking about securities, uh, you need to, um, you know, have that accredited investor uh, designation. Um, now to uh, go to your next question about minimums. Yes. That's going to vary depend depending on the sponsor. Um, you know, some sponsors have a minimum of seventy-five thousand uh, dollars. Some have a minimum of twenty-five thousand dollars. It's all going to depend on the sponsor. Um, you know, their uh, their business model, uh, the investors they work with, the deal itself. Um, so everybody's going to be different. 
Mm, okay, that's yeah. great. Good, good to know. Good information yeah. to know. Um, I said that I have two more questions. All right, I'm ready. So now that we have a better understanding of this, then I want to ask, like, like I think we kind of address it. The structure is very different, and it depends on your income. But what's the advantage, or like, why would you choose this way over like investing directly? in the US because I have a lot of clients who are interested in the potential cash flow like you mm -hmm. said the same thing that that uh, you mentioned earlier that's being drawn to the US the US is a powerhouse in terms of economy um, there are a lot more people a lot more demand for housing and the housing prices are a lot more I guess reasonable as it compared to like local Ontario uh, prices and they got drawn into investing in the US um, Single family home approach mm -hmm. uh, versus investing in multifamily. What's a, what's the a difference? There's many differences. Uh, number one is the strength of the cash flow. Mm. Um, now this is all market dependent, uh, but let's say you, if we're comparing in the same market a single family home or a duplex versus uh, mm. a large apartment building, yeah. cash flow is way stronger with apartments. You have the economies of scale there. Yeah. Um, you know your cost per unit for expenses goes way down. Your management costs like you have one tax bill versus, you know, if you have 10 properties. Mm. Um, and then you also have stability. Um, not a, it's really from a couple different points of view. Number one, lenders love lending on multifamily. Uh, lenders will compete to lend on multifamily because oh. it's so stable. Um, and when you look at, uh, you know, commercial real estate as a whole, uh, you know, office, industrial, retail, and uh, multifamily, the past three recessions, because I'm counting uh, coronavirus as a recession. It is. Um, oh, I shouldn't mention coronavirus <laughs> on YouTube. You might have to bleep that out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get you demonetized. Um, but uh, but when, you, when we look at the past three recessions, multifamily outperformed every single commercial asset class by far. So uh, the, the rent downturn was minimum. Uh, the, uh, the asset surpassing past the previous peak uh, picked up far uh, faster than all the other assets. So when I'm looking at an asset, where do I want to place my money? Um, sure, it's about the good times, but it's more important how it performs in the bad times. So um, not only does it provide the strong cash flow, the appreciation side through forced appreciation, but also that stability. Um, that's what makes it a winning combination. Plus, we haven't even talked about the, the cost segregation and everything. That's not, that doesn't really make sense for single-family homes, mm -hmm. but it plays a huge role uh, in the multifamily space. So if somebody's looking at buying properties on their own versus investing in the syndication, it all kind of depends on what you want to do. Like if you want to be an active investor and own your uh, houses, like that's great. That's the trajectory I was on, but then I realized it wasn't the right one for me. Mm. But if you're looking to scale and have that cash flow as well, um, but also get some great tax benefits and have uh, you know your money put into these more stable um, you know uh, businesses, really, um, you probably want to consider syndication or funds. Um, so it, it all depends. Like I'm, I'm never one to tell people where they should invest because everybody has different things they want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, I, I just know the things I wanted to accomplish. Single family couldn't really do that for me with where I wanted to go. Yep. And, and that's why I switched over to multifamily. Well, that's a great, great answer because financing is definitely one of the roadblocks that every single, uh, I guess, single family home uh, or like even duplex, smaller multiplex um, investors that are facing. Um, okay, so last question. It's not quite a question. I know you're doing something exciting. Oh, yeah. And I mean, um, it's I, super exciting to me and super hard in my opinion because I've been there. So tell us a little bit about the conference. Yeah, so the multifamily conference, it's yep. a two day event coming up in Toronto, May 14th and 15th, mm. 2022. Um, and uh, we are bringing in investors from across North America, Canada and the US uh, to Toronto to mm -hmm. talk about strictly multifamily. Um, as far as I know, this is the one and only multifamily event in Canada. Uh, really excited about who we have. We've got uh, Kevin O'Leary coming mm -hmm. in to talk about raising capital. Yep. Uh, Joe Fairless, who controls over a billion dollars of multifamily real estate. Uh, a good friend of mine, he's coming in to speak. Uh, we've got Joel Block, who is a master at structuring. 
Uh, we've got so many others. Pierre Paul Turgeon's coming yeah. in and they keep like the list goes on. So um, super excited to have everybody coming in. It's going to be a great way to network with other investors and build some connections. That's amazing because I already got my VIP ticket. You did? Yes, yes. I already got my early bird pricing VIP ticket. So for anyone who's interested to finding out more about what Seth is up to, or even uh, investing in a uh, multifamily unit in the US, or even just learning about investing in multifamily, this is a good conference to, uh, to go to and to learn, get yourself, get your feet wet. Yeah, and maybe what we can do is we have a chance for people to actually win a free VIP ticket. Oh, awesome. Uh, so we can put a link right down below this video uh, mm -hmm. uh, to where people can register and enter for uh, that, uh, that chance to win. Oh, that sounds great. So we will definitely include that in the, in the show note. Okay, I think we've taken up a lot of your time. So thank you so much for like sharing all these ins and outs about investing in multi-unit in the States because I can see why you're doing it. I, I'm a slow adopter, so I'm like easing in my, myself into this space because I see a lot of people with uh, a lot of success investing in these multi-units. It's just that 150 units is a huge number to me. It is, but don't be intimidated because so uh, don't be intimidated. The, found, the fundamentals remain the same. Mm -hmm. It's just you're dealing with extra zeros. That's what it is. It, it always helps when you have a guide. That's why I'm going to learn about it at this multifamily conference. So you can check out and get more information about the conference at multifamilyconference.ca. And it will be included as part of um, our description below. Thank you so much for uh, coming yeah. on and um, Again, appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I had a great time. Uh, thanks for uh, listening to me talk. Uh, listening to me talk. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great day.